Well, we're in our fifth week of our study of the book of Ephesians. And um, the, over the last three weeks, we've spent some time digging into Paul's doxology, which is a fancy word meaning a word of praise. And in verse 3 of chapter 1, he starts with praise, and at the end of verse 14, he ends with, to the praise of his glory. And why does he praise God? Because of all that God has done in us, in Christ. I'm going to miss some, but a brief recap. He chose us. He redeemed us. He forgave us. Uh, he graced us. He lavished his grace upon us. He sealed us in the Holy Spirit. These are all the things God has done in Christ, in us. And those ins are important, especially the in Christ part. So, very briefly, chapter one in many ways is one long prayer divided into a couple of different parts. The first part being this hymn of praise. And then starting in verse 15, which we'll work our way through to the end of the chapter, it's, he turns to thanksgiving, he turns to intercession, and then he ends it with an affirmation of Christ's work and who we are. So let me just recommend to you, if you struggle in how to pray, please come back to the first chapter of Ephesians and model your prayer life after how Paul prays. And now today, for this part, it's especially appropriate, I think, because Paul is praying for the church. He was praying for the church in Ephesus. By extension now, this is the prayer we get to offer for the church as well, which means this is the prayer we get to offer for ourselves. And so with that, let's look at Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. <clears throat> for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And that feels like a mouthful. And in the original Greek, it is kind of a mouthful. We talked about how in 3 through 14, that's all one sentence. And um, he basically completes all of this in two sentences in the original Greek. For those of you who want to pull out your Greek New Testaments and take a look at that. Paul is so moved by the Spirit that it's as if he can't put his pen down. He just has to keep writing to extol who God is and then to um, um, pray on behalf of the Ephesians so the first part, again, it's praising God for who God is and what he has done in the life of the Ephesians. This next part now is he's turning to the Ephesians. He's saying, I'm praying to you that God, who has done this good work in you, 
will actually manifest it in your life so that you will understand what it is he has done. So two parts to this. So he starts out for this reason. So he's, again, he's praying because of what God has accomplished in them. And he goes on and he says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Now remember, and I would invite you when you have time to go back to Acts 19 and 20, talks about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. He knew a lot of these people. But now when he's writing, many years have passed. And so there are probably many more new members to the church that he doesn't know. And it's also a um, good indication that this letter wasn't just to the church at Ephesus, but it was probably what's called a, a circular letter that would go out to many churches in many surrounding cities as well. But anyway, he has heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus. So now I have to underscore, he's not praising them or thanking God because of their faith alone. Okay. I need now. I probably have your attention. We live in a day and age where people like to say, oh yeah, I'm a person of faith. But faith in what? Or faith in whom, more precisely? And here Paul addresses it. It's faith in the Lord Jesus. It's not mere intellectual assent. It is trust. It is confidence in who Jesus is. He's the object of their faith. And then he says, and your love toward all the saints. True faith is not a private affair. True faith is always to manifest itself in an outpouring of love for others. And we see this here at Grace. This could be Paul's letter to, uh, to the Washburnians, if you will. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. We have faith. We have love for the saints. Those two always go together. Jesus, in John chapter 13, said, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, there's the faith aspect, if you have love for one another. So, faith is profession in Christ, and it's expressed through love for the saints. Paul, in the sister letter that he wrote to Colossians, says this, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, and of the love that you have for all the saints. Faith and love are to always go together. And um, the Apostle John in 1 John 3, 23 says that we are commanded to believe, to love God, and commanded to love the saints. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. So again, faith and love are always to go together. And Paul gives thanks to the gives thanks to God for the Ephesians' display of both faith and love. Theirs is a real faith. Then he goes on to say that he's praying that God would manifest again what he has done in them in Christ. So again. He's, he's not leaving behind verses 3 through 14, but he's bringing that in and he's saying, God has done this in you. Now this is what I pray that he works in you. Working it in us in such a way that we become consciously aware of it and it becomes how we live our lives. So he says that God is... Um, the God of both of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's also our God, and he's the father of glory, which is an interesting kind of phrase, basically means he's our glorious father. He is ultimate majesty, and he is the one to whom all glory belongs. We need to have that mindset. 
Verses 12 and 14, he says, to the praise of his glory, that needs to constantly be on our lips. Then he goes on and begins to make supplication for them specifically by saying, he's asking that they be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, by mentioning the spirit here, Paul is bringing the Trinity into full bear for us. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he prays that the spirit of wisdom would be at work in their lives. Father, Son, Holy Spirit always go together. Our salvation is Trinitarian. Our Christian life is Trinitarian. It originated with the Father. The Father sent the Son. The Son accomplished our salvation on the cross. And then the Spirit came and sealed us. Okay? He, um, he applies it, salvation, to our lives. He empowers us day in, day out. So the Trinity is vitally important. We need to keep Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always before our eyes. And then he goes on to, to use this. He doesn't just call him the, the Holy Spirit. He calls him the spirit of wisdom and revelation. This is not mere intellectual assent. Again, you go back up a few verses. They've been sealed in the Holy Spirit. So he's praying. He's asking that God would awaken them to the spirit's role of revealing wisdom and revelation to them that we would be awakened to the Spirit's role of revealing wisdom and revelation to us. You know, we can, we can become, I think, there's a danger of becoming too cavalier. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Now I'm on to the next thing. There is no next thing. We are in Christ. But what comes next is by what the Holy Spirit brings to us. We need to... Um, go deeper in understanding who God is, go deeper in understanding who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And we do that through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then um, the Holy Spirit making us sensitive so that um, the blessings that God makes available to his people, we would be sensitive to understanding these blessings that God makes available to his people. And he makes them available in the church. So he's, he's been underscoring in Christ, in him, in the, in the beloved. And we're going to see the phrase in the church again and again and again in this passage as well. The two go hand in hand. If you're in Christ, you are in the church. Blessings that are manifested from Christ come to us in the church. Each one of us has an important part to play in the church. Okay? So, the wisdom and the revelation is knowledge of him. We will never plumb the depths of knowing who God is. And God's request, or Paul's request makes it very theocentric. Again, it's not, oh, I want to be a wise man. No. I need to grow in wisdom and knowledge of who God is. So, it's very focused on, on God, the Godhead, and it will result in us continuing to be changed as God works in us. Look at how Paul wrote the Colossians in 1.9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's a beautiful prayer. That's what we need. That's what we need to be praying for ourselves and for each other. He prays it here for the Ephesians. He prays it for the Colossians. That we be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's where our life is. That's where we need to, to, to live it. So he goes on then to say that with that, he prays that God would enlighten the eyes of the heart, which is... Um, Kind of an interesting use of a couple of organs of the body, but it's not that surprising to us. Um, many of you probably remember the chorus, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
right? Paul was way ahead of us. He wrote that, those lyrics a long time ago, okay? That chorus should be more than just a chorus. It should be a prayer that influences our lives. Open the eyes of our heart. Our heart is the innermost part of our being. It's, it's not our brain, and it's certainly not the heart in our chest. It's that deep, deep part of who we truly are. And when he prays for enlightenment, he's not just saying, I pray that here on May 5th that you get enlightened. He's, he's praying that you be enlightened on May 5th and May 6th in 2024, in 2025, and if you live long enough, 2035. Some of you are young enough, you might even see the turn of the century if the Lord tarries, right? We are to live lives enlightened by the Spirit of God at work in us for the glory of God. That's what Paul is praying for them that we would see, that we would understand, again, what God has done and what he is doing in us. So then he moves on and he specifies three distinct areas that he's praying for them. He prays concerning hope, concerning an inheritance, and concerning power. In verse 8, he says to them, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you? Then what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And then in verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? So that we would know hope, we would know the inheritance, and we would know the power. And with the mention of hope, Paul closes the loop on what's called the, the Pauline triad. Paul is famous for talking about faith, hope, and love. And here we have it in this passage between what comes above with, I heard of your faith and your love for the saints, and now I pray that you have hope. And we all know what hope is, right? Hope is wishful thinking, right? Hope is I hope it doesn't rain on our cookout, right? Hope is what some of you might be thinking right now. I hope he doesn't talk as long as he did last time. You know? And to that, I can only say that's wishful thinking. <laughs> Biblical hope is way deeper than that. Biblical hope always conveys the sense of confident expectation of God's presence and saving actions despite the adverse realities of the current situation. We don't have hope in hope. We don't make hope an idol. We have hope in the living God who, who works in our lives. So whatever we're facing today, Paul is praying that you would have hope to which he has called you. It's, it's a painful thing to live without hope. It really is. And, and some of us m might have been there. Some of us might feel like we're, we're kind of dabbling in, in some hopelessness right now. This prayer, if you're in Christ, this prayer applies to you. That you would have that hope, that assurance, that confidence, because he has called you. He has called you, and therefore, you can have hope. One commentator said, the world is the Lord's, and we are his forever. The universe is not random, and we are never abandoned. Our God is just and gracious, sovereign and saving. I'm going to read that again. Our God is just and gracious, sovereign and saving. This was the Ephesians' hope. And it is ours also. Our hope is in the one who has called us. As if a father calls his beloved child out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the foundation of our hope. So then he says, I pray that you would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. 
Now, up above in verse um, 14, he says that the, the spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. So it would follow naturally that when he's talking about inheritance here, it, it just means that someday we will inherit profound blessings from God that are guaranteed in the Holy Spirit, and they come to us in Christ. And that makes perfect sense. Okay? That makes perfect sense. However, Paul's wording allows for a slight variation. Both options are fantastic options for us. So the one is, we receive an inheritance. Here's the second option. God, um, God actually considers us to be the rich inheritance he provides himself. Think of that. That we are, are God's inheritance. We know, using another metaphor, that the son is the bridegroom, and he's going to take a bride. And, is, and he is preparing a bride, and the father will present the bride to his son. It's along that, those same lines that God, in the working of his church, is going to gather us in, and we are his inheritance. That's an amazing thought. It's an amazing thought. Paul wants his readers to understand that they are of great value to God. They are rich in glory, and they are his inheritance. The New Living Translation says that we are his holy people who are his, his rich and glorious inheritance. Now, we should not get big heads because of this. This should cause us to fall to our knees in humble gratitude and praise and adoration. The um, 20th century New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce said this, Paul prays here that his readers may appreciate the value which God places on them. Do you hear that? Paul is praying that we would appreciate the value God places on us. His plan to accomplish his eternal purpose through them, through us, as the first fruits of the reconciled universe of the future, in order that their lives, that our lives, may be in keeping with his high calling and that they may accept, that we may accept in grateful humility the grace and glory thus lavished on them. God has done a work in us through Christ of just unspeakable magnitude. And Paul prays that we would understand the riches of this inheritance. And then he goes on to pray that we would understand his power, his power toward us in verse 19. And what is, and, and note how he, he doesn't just say power. Note how he describes this. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? He just piles up power terminology in this verse. It's immeasurably great. It's working through Christ in us, and it's according to his great might. This is God's miraculous, life-giving, transforming power at work in those who believe. And then he goes on to say, he, you know, he, he anchors it, he compares it uh, to something he's already done in verse 20. And what he worked in Christ, what he worked in Christ, listen to this, when he, one, raised him from the dead, and two, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is that power that Paul is saying God is working in our lives now. It's not a similar power. It's the same resurrection and ascension power that God worked in delivering Christ from the grave and then seating him at his right hand on high. That's the power 
Paul is saying that we need to come to know that God is working in our lives today. God's power at work in us. We need to become aware of that. And we need to hold fast to that because that makes all the difference in the world. We all know this Christian life is impossible to live on your own. We're not meant to live it on our own. We are meant to live it with, from a foundation of hope, understanding his riches, and noting that it's his power at work in us and through us. Okay. So your conversion was no small thing. Next week, Lord willing, Paul's going to go in uh, more detail in chapter 2, just how God worked that conversion in us. And from the starting point, where we were when he brought us to life. And remember, it's God's power at work. So, um, so we're of great value. We have a hope. We have an inheritance. God's power is at work. Now, lest you become off the rails, if you will, in, sense, in this sense of, boy, I've got, I've got God, God's power at work. I can take on all comers. Just let me, have, you know, come on at me. I'll take you on. Paul wrote this from prison. Now, I don't want to go to prison. That's a scary thought. But if, but if Paul could write about the immeasurable might of Paul's, of God's power from a prison cell, how much more so do we need to be latching hold of, growing an understanding of God's power at work in us? Okay. You're, you're, you're looking at me with, like, like my mic's not working or something, are you, are you understanding what he's saying here? This is life itself. It's more than life transforming. Again, he's given us hope. We have riches and we have access to power um, because of what he's done. And he's praying that the Holy Spirit will enlighten our eyes and our lives, our eyes need to be enlightened. They absolutely do. So then at this point then, he focuses for the remaining verses in chapter one. He focuses on God's power. Again, it's this great power that he worked in Christ in verse 12, in verse 20. It's his resurrection power, his ascension power. He calls it incomparably great. Now, what can you compare something to when it's called incomparably great? Not a thing. Not a thing. One commentator referred to it as, it's God's brute force and authority are on display in these two events. So if God can undo death in Christ and seat him at his right hand, then nothing is too difficult for him to accomplish in his church, which means in us. Lord God, I pray that you would um, enlighten our eyes, the eyes of our heart, that we would understand these blessings that you've given us. Then in verse 21, as if he hasn't said enough about where Christ is seated at his right hand and the power that he has, he, he just lists out. It's almost this, this stream of thought. He says Christ is far above, okay? It's not like his head is just above the, the waters of tumult. He's far above. That's where God has placed him. He's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Okay. He's covered all his bases. 
There isn't anything that falls outside these categories. In particular, when he's talking about especially rule and authority, power and dominion, that's, that's language that has its roots in, in, in some of the Jewish writings of the, of the Old Testament era that weren't necessarily in, in the Old Testament. It has to do with the spiritual realm. Jesus is above all spiritual powers. Every name that is named, that can refer to that. It also has a sense of the geopolitical powers. Now, this was written in first century, modern day Turkey. It was part of this little country. It was in the news for a while. It's called the Roman Empire. And he's saying, Jesus is above Caesar. He's also writing to them in Ephesus. And remember what was in Ephesus. Ephesus was the home to the temple of Diana or Artemis. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This in itself was no small thing. But the Ephesian culture revolved around the worship of Ephesus. Artemis, this Greek and Roman goddess. There was big business associated with making idols to Ephesus, to, uh, to Artemis, to Diana. Paul saying, Jesus is high above Ephesus, uh, Artemis. Jesus is high above Satan. And being in Christ, being in the church, means... We are protected by his power and we have access to his power so that Satan can't touch us. All authority, power, dominion, every name, and in this age and the age to come. So however long the Lord might tarry before he returns, Jesus is seated above all. And in the age to come, he reigns, he rules on high at the right hand of God our Father. This should have given the Ephesians profound comfort and encouragement and inspiration. This should give we Washburnians profound comfort and encouragement and power. The truth written to Ephesus is the truth written to us as well. We need to remember this because Ephesians, for a number of things, is noted, especially for chapter 6, where he talks about putting on the full armor of God. Don't disconnect the full armor of God from Jesus having all power and authority. Because it does us no good to try to put on the armor of God if Jesus doesn't have all power and authority. In fact, as you're reading through Ephesus, and I would encourage you to read through it again and again and again, from week to week, you will see how these themes in chapter one are going to pop up in the chapters that remain. And, um, and I will just say this to you husbands. Paul's going to get into talking about marriage. And he says, we need to love our wives as Christ loved the church. If we don't have access to all the power that Jesus has, and we have access to it through the Holy Spirit. That's more wishful thinking. Okay? Here's what Paul wrote to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The war is over. Yes, we're fighting skirmishes. We have battles we need to fight. But the war is over. Jesus is triumphant. And that word triumphant would have special significance to, um, to those living in the Roman Empire. Because when a general came back from victory in battle, his triumph paraded before him. All the captive soldiers and slaves that he took from the enemy. They were on display saying, we're over you now. 
This is what Jesus is. He has triumphed over every power, both natural and supernatural. And he has done that for his church. Verses 22 and 23, he says that um, he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is, his, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Again, Paul goes to great lengths to underscore just the magnitude of what God in Christ has done for the church which means for us, and we need to hold fast to that. The language he uses uh, draws from Psalm 8, 6. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That Psalm was written, you know, David asked the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? But its fulfillment comes in Christ. And in Psalm 110, verse 1, he says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's what's at work here. That's the reference. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not some, not a portion, but all authority where? In both heaven and earth. It's been given to Jesus. And Paul is saying it's been given to him for the church. That means in us, we have the opportunity to glorify him. So Jesus is head over all things. He's given to the church. All powers submit to him. Christ's supremacy is for the benefit of the church Jesus, this is what one commentator wrote, Jesus is changing the world for the good of the church by means of the church. Jesus uses us to change the world. We have a job to do. Another made reference to the divine bridegroom will be present to protect and promote his bride. That's us. We don't do this on our own. It's something Jesus has already accomplished, but now he call, calls us to make it come to fruition. He calls the church his body. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in everything he might be preeminent. Again, Colossians is a sister letter to uh, Ephesians. The head guides, sustains inspires, empowers, enables, and strengthens the body. But the body, Paul writes, is the fullness of him. The church is the fullness of him who fills everything. Thus she completes his purpose for him, even as he designs everything for her. He fills all in all. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So it's kind of like this. God fills Christ with all his deity. Christ fills the church. And we at work then bring his fullness to completion. One commentator wrote, The messianic king whom God has made victorious over all the cosmic forces ra ranged against his people is united with the church. So the messianic king is united with the church, which because of this union, the church is also victorious over these evil forces. He went on to write, God has given Christ to the church in his role as victor and head over all things, including the enemies of God and his people, Christ and the church, his body are one. Thus, Christ's victory is also the church's victory. Do we understand that? The victory is Christ's. The victory is ours because we are his body and we are in Christ. Another commentator wrote, the truth of the gospel is that we are immortal. Our time is eternal. And for those who put their faith in the eternal God who controls this world, 
There is a happy ending. Always. Always. The key is, for every one of us, are we in Christ? Are you in Christ? Have you come to faith in Christ? Or are you merely being good? Whatever that standard of goodness might be. If you're not in Christ, we're going to, in, uh, later in Ephesians, he talks about when we are outside of Christ, we had no hope. If you're not in Christ, I pray that you'd be reconciled. Come to him in faith this, today. Confess your sins and embrace him as Lord by faith. I'll be happy to talk to anyone uh, after service. If you have questions, we have others who'd be happy to meet with anyone if you have any questions. But don't, don't go another day just assuming you're in Christ. That's dangerous ground. I pray that the Holy Spirit would enlighten your eyes and you'd come to faith in him. And for those of us who profess Christ as Lord, I'm going to close with how Paul started this in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Lord, there is so much here. It is beyond our mere mental comprehension. Unless we are in you, it is beyond our grasp, beyond our understanding. And being in you, we still rely on you to cause our understanding to grow. Lord, open the eyes of our heart that we would know the hope to which you've called us, that we would know the riches of your glorious inheritance, that we would know what is the immeasurable greatness of your power toward those who believe. Lord, that we would know you, that we would know you, know that you've embraced us, and through faith, by grace, we are saved in Christ. And Father, now we're going to be moving to communion. And so I pray that you would prepare our hearts, that none of us this morning would take communion without first examining where we are before you. Lord, meet us here. Prepare us, wash us clean, that we can partake of, of, the, of the bread and of, of the fruit of the vine with pure hands and hearts filled with gratitude for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.